Welcome to Grace Community Church's virtual Sunday service. We're so honored that you are here. We hope that everything is going really well in your life. And if you're looking for a place for encouragement and support and love, you came to the right channel. Um, we also want to mention this Sunday that if you feel that you've benefited from seeing these videos and you'd like them to, to continue, please reach out to us and let us know. You can click the link below and email the church and um, we really appreciate it. So thank you and enjoy. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to come before you this morning to have your word presented to us. Lord, we ask that you would open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts, help us to receive the blessings, the instruction, and the encouragement that is part of your message to us. So Lord, we commit our time to you. We ask that you be with us, and it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.
want to encourage you as you continue to support Grace Church. Our goal as a church is to stay faithful to the Word. Our goal is to teach the Word without uh, watering it down, without compromising it as much as we know how. We don't know all of the answers, but we do know that holding to what God teaches is what we're supposed to do. And that's our main purpose. Stay on the Word. Stay on God. Stay with Jesus. Don't be compromised. Don't be watered down by the world. Don't give in to the pressures of worldly uh, resistance of the faith. Instead, we hold to it. And we are found to be, hopefully, like Noah and like Enoch and like Abraham and like David and like Jesus, faithful to him and not compromising. Let's pray. For those who continue to support us, Lord, blessings upon them. May your hand be upon us as we live in the time that we live in. For we do not understand and recognize everything that's happening. It all looks so alarming to us. So help us instead to look to you, for that's what the scriptures have taught us today. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Since everything else is so changeable, since everyone else is so malleable, so compromised, help us to look to you because you never compromise. You never change. Help us to hold to you. Though the whole world turn away from you, help us to hold to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning.
and welcome to part 12 of the plan of God and I've entitled this part of the series the wrath of God revealed so let's pray to the Lord and ask him to help us to properly see this um, my goal as a teacher and as a pastor of a local church is not to teach and preach an exhaustive series in the book of Revelation. Many have written books, many really studied people who understand way better than I a lot of the imagery and a lot of the prophetic uh, references in the book of Revelation. I, as a pastor, and since I'm constantly involved, involved with different people at different stages of Christian life, my goal is to try to help them to figure out how to receive this information and to live their lives out in light of this information in spite of everything that's going around them. What initially motiva motivated me to this whole thing was all of the unrest that occurred after the beginning of the pandemic and the social in unrest and the political uh, divisions that were going on. But as I have gone through this series more and more, it's taken my eyes off of all of that and caused me to focus in on the overarching theme of God having a plan. And in this plan, he sees and foretells all of the things that are coming to pass, that have come to pass, that are coming to pass, and that will come to pass with the ultimate objective of bringing his people into the kingdom of God. So as a pastor, my concern is that his people don't get so distracted by all of the temporal worldly stuff going on around them, even though, yes, we need to be aware, but to have a confidence in the Lord and the Lord's ability to execute his plan perfectly. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the revelation which, given to the churches through the Apostle John, has been a book that has been oft mistaught and misrepresented. And many conclusions have been reached in Christian history that were incorrect about what it is saying. Indeed, we have to admit that we cannot properly understand it all, and we cannot properly um, have everything nailed down for us so it just fits perfectly in our little heads. We need to acknowledge that these things are global, they're universal, they're in the spirit realm, they're in the physical realm, they concern your throne, they concern the Christ, they concern the angels, Satan and the demons, and all humans, both saved and unsaved. The material universe itself will be invaded and dealt with by the spirit realms, because you are spirit, and those who worship you must worship in spirit and in truth. So now in Jesus' name, guide us and teach us with the help of the Holy Spirit, who is our teacher and guides and leads us into all truth. Amen. Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me. I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. These are the words of Jesus Christ himself. And even when I just now spoke them, I felt a, a sense of great responsibility. So let's look at the next installment of God has a plan. What we now see is the, the last, if you will, great uh, sign, metaphorical, uh, or literal sign that John the Apostle sees in heaven. Because remember, he's going back and forth from earth to heaven, sometimes back on earth, like when he received the little scroll from that one angel standing on the sea. Um, here we see that he sees in heaven. So here he is back in heaven. He's back where God's throne is at. I see another great and mar marvelous sign. He has already expressed and shown us many different things that he has seen with the help of God's Spirit. What did he see? Seven angels with the seven last plagues. Last because with them God's wrath is completed. As I mentioned to you, everything from Revelation 12, 13, and 14 was a parenthetical pause almost because in Revelation um, 
11, at the end of Revelation 11, the seventh trumpet gets blown. And then we see the opening of the temple and the ark of the testimony is shown. So we're back at that. That's where we're back at here. And what then happens after that is this. I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign. These seven angels come out. And they come out, and with this, it says, God's wrath is completed. So the seventh trumpet basically reveals this to us. Everything is and has been setting up to this, including the rise of Satan's beast empires and the rise and fall of dictatorships and malevolent, uh, malevolent dictators who are satanically uh, inspired and controlled with the exception of, I think, Nebuchadnezzar, who became a believer in God. I saw this, this last sign in heaven. And when this is over, God's wrath is over, which is an interesting concept, because in this, God is going to pour out on his uh, creation, the earth, because he has decided that it, it will be completed and finished here. It's going to complete his final judgments. So the seventh trumpet remembers the martyrs of the fifth seal. Do you remember the fifth seal, the martyrs under the altar? And they cry out, how long until you uh, remember our blood that was spilled on the earth because of uh, us being servants of yours? And it got told to them until the full number of your brethren who need to die the way you died, die. So apparently it continues to accelerate and more and more and more martyrs uh, are are if you will, executed in the, as we approach the end of time. So God answers this, and here's how he answers it. Here, here's how he remembers this. I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and over his image and over the number of his name. They held harps given them by God. So what we see here is all of those who refuse that, refuse that last uh, ditch effort by the enemy, by Satan, to use a human-based dictatorship to dominate the world and to intimidate the people of, of God. So the Bible pictures them here. They're now in front of God, and they're victorious over him. So it inspires a song because of this. A song is inspired by this. We don't know exactly what this song sounded like. We don't know the music behind it or the meter of it, but we do know that it says that a song is inspired by it. It's called the Song of Moses and the Song of the Lamb. So this song is sung and it says, here's the words, great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. So in the song, what is being said here is, it's a song that is sung to God in a way. It's sung to him, greater marvelous are your deeds. You are just, you are right. And everything that's going to happen, no one can blame you for this because world and human history has shown that um, your actions at the end of time are completely justified. So the seventh trumpet prepares the seven bowls of God's wrath. So as with all of the other things that were shown in the opening of all of the seals, each seal uh, had a, a heavenly um, consequence, if you will, or, or, or something happened in heaven, a horseman came out, and on earth the results of that uh, were played out. And here we finally get to the last seal and the last trumpet of the last seal. And what we see here is seven more, if you will, um, representations of what God was going to do. Seven angels with the seven bowls of wrath of God. So after this, I looked in heaven. The tabernacle of the testimony in the temple was opened. So here we see it again, just like it said in Revelation 11, the Ark of the Testimony was opened and everyone got to see it. At the end of the, of the opening of all those seals, the scroll reveals this, God's last testament, if you will. Uh, 
Out of the temple came seven angels. So inside of the temple in heaven, we've already seen that this interaction of angels and, and humans and demons, if you will, and um, the redeemed and the unredeemed, it's all at the end of time, it all comes to a, almost as if God removes that which separates us. They were dressed in clean, shining linen and wore golden sashes around their chests. One of the four living creatures, you have to go back all the way to Revelation 4 to start seeing the descriptions of these creatures. They're not called angels, they're called the living creatures. What are they? In, in the King James English, it calls them the four beasts, the four living beasts. He gave the seven angels seven bowls filled with the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. No one could even enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels was complete. So it's almost as if the temple, the center of worship in heaven, the real temple, because God is about to finally express his justifiable wrath and anger against sin and rebellion and Satan and humans who, who continue to thumb their nose at him. When he finally does do this, no one can come close because God in his anger is terrifying. The Bible reveals this all over. Who can stand in the day of his wrath? Um, well, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. This being called God, when he really does release his anger, because if anything God is, is ultimately patient. Everybody always asks, why don't you do something? When are you going to do something? Well, this is the description of when he finally does do what he needs to do. What will happen at the end of time? He pours out his wrath. That word wrath is another word for anger, displeasure, hatred of the putrefaction and the rot of sin and rebellion. He is justifiable in demonstrating this anger and this wrath. Do you remember when the sixth seal was opened and they, the human beings of earth said, run and hide under the mountains, under the rocks? Who can stand from the wrath of God and the wrath of the Lamb? Well, that's in view right here. So the first bowl, bowls are, if you know anything about, you know, containers, uh, a vial holds it liquid in or a jug and you pour it out and it kind of uh, takes a little time to empty out. A bowl, if you put something in it, you can just throw it out like a wash basin and it comes right out. That's to kind of um, describe how the final uh, seven uh, expressions of God's anger against sin and rebellion the, how it's dished out. It's just thrown out really fast. It's a quick thing. I heard it in a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go, pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath and it's specific on the earth. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the land and ugly and painful sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshiped his image. So the result of the first bowl is boils or Painful sores break out on the people. This is also um, hearkening back to the, to the boils that came on the people of Egypt when the people of God Israel were there in the Pharaoh's government and they were being oppressed and they were being enslaved and mistreated. And God began to visit them with plagues. It was all a kind of a foretelling of what was come, going to come at the end of time. And it happens again. And it's a worldwide thing. Everyone who took this mark all of a sudden finds themselves uh, subjected to a terrible divine visitation on their physical health. The second bowl is poured out and everything in the sea dies. In the beginnings of all of these judgments, we saw that one third of the sea, one third of the sea life would die. But here we see all of it die. The second angel pours out his bowl on the sea. It turned to blood into like that of a dead man. Uh, I didn't research this, but the blood of a dead person is blood that is um, separated. The red blood cells and the white blood cells separate. And um, that's why when Jesus was pierced with a, with the spear, it came out, as John says, water and blood. So it was the separation of the white blood vessels and the red blood vessels. And every living thing in the sea died. So the second bowl brings a, a uh, judgment upon sea life and upon, um, uh, on everything that lives in the sea, which would create big problems for the whole planet. 
The third bowl turns water into blood, not sea water, but fresh water. So the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. Think of all of the fresh water on planet Earth. All of the rivers, all of the river systems, all of the fountains, all of the fresh lakes, every river and fountain and stream you could have ever thought about, every single one of them become blood. Uh, that happened in Egypt as well. The Nile was turned into blood and they had to dig for water on the side. I don't know what will be uh, done at that time uh, concerning people who are living there, but I know that it'll be a really, really severe judgment because water is life. Water is where how we live. And so it's going to be a real difficult judgment. The, the, and then I heard an angel in charge of the waters say, it's interesting that we've already seen that there's this angel in charge of the fire, angel in charge of the waters. He says, you are just in these judgments, you who were the Holy One. You who are and were the Holy One. The reason I underline this, you who are and were, is because something's missing. What's missing there is he who was, who is, and is to come. So it doesn't talk about who is to come. Why? Because he's come. That's why. Because no more waiting. He's here now. He's dealing with things now. He is not to come. He's there. The Holy One, because you have so judged, for they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. That means they'll drink blood. And I heard the altar respond, yes, Lord God Almighty. Remember I told you that in the real heaven of the book of Revelation, things are different than what we're used to. The altar itself talks, yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. Why the altar? The altar is where sacrifice is made. And since sacrifice is made on the altar to deal for men's failures and sins, the altar is finally saying, you know what? No amount of sacrifice is going to help these guys anymore. They deserve this. The fourth bowl intensifies solar heat. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was giving power to scorch people with fire. They were seared by the intense heat, and they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues, but they refused to repent and glorify him. Do you remember the two witnesses? They hated them, and they had a big celebration where they gave gifts to each other when they were dead. Well, God can never die. and They simply just curse him like they do now anyway. It seems like that's the biggest curse word around, the name of God, and he said in the law of the Israelites that if they took the name of God in vain, they were to be put to death. Well, the whole world is guilty of using God's name as a curse word. And I think uh, we need to think this through a little bit more how we speak because uh, using the name God in a curse word is an affront to God. But more than that, God actually allows this angel's bowl to be poured out on the sun. And apparently the sun is... Uh, intensified in its heat. Maybe there are bigger solar flares, flares, or maybe the Lord just starts stirring up the fire in the sun so that it begins to burn and scorch. It doesn't say burn them to death. It scorches them with fire. The fifth bowl is darkness. So he pours out another bowl. The fifth angel pours out his bowl on the throne of the beast and his kingdom, and it was plunged into darkness. This happened with Pharaoh. This happened with his government and his dictatorial rule against the people of God, the Jews who were his slaves, and he didn't want to let them go. So God is doing the same thing here at the end of time. He pours out darkness on them, and they nod their tongues in agony and curse the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, but they refused to repent of what they had done. And what they had done was receive the mark of the beast and the devil and decided that, that the devil and the beast were God and not God. So God allows them to basically suffer the consequence of that decision. He allows it to happen. He allows us to see sin nature completely unmasked, the sin nature in human beings who are unsaved, that they cannot repent, they will not repent, even if there are direct evidences of the Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, beginning to intervene in real human history in a way that causes them all to know that it's Him. Because who are they cursing? They're cursing God now. Not just Christians or Jews, now they're cursing God directly. The sixth bowl preps Armageddon. 
The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. Its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings of the east. Then I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon. Don't forget that Jesus said from his mouth proceeds lies. Out of his mouth proceeds all of this horrible evil propaganda. Uh, he's the father of lies. So these spirits apparently are some kind of a demonic propaganda that is released at the end of time out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So false religion, false political entities, and uh, spiritual darkness all um, release their, their falsity on a whole world. They are spirits of demons performing miraculous signs. They go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for battle on the great day of God Almighty. So as if to, to add insult to injury, he apparently with his supernatural power is able to muster the forces of demons and humans together against God. And that is the preparation for Armageddon, the last conflict on earth uh, before the millennial kingdom between God and Satan's forces. Behold, I come like a thief. So again, here's a, one of those famous parentheses in Revelation where you're reading all of this uh, really intense stuff going on and God stops everything and he says, look, look, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed are you who stay awake and keep your clothes with you so that you may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. Then they gathered the kings together at the place in Hebrew that is called Armageddon. So what's God doing here? He's reminding his people in the midst of all of this that you've got to stay awake. You got to keep your clothes on. And if you look at the terminology about garments and clothing and being washed and having your clothing washed in the blood of the lamb, that is to not deny him, to not forsake him, to not give him up for something else and someone else because that would shamefully expose you and show you as naked. So he's encouraging his people to stay true. And even though it's going to get really, really intense, stay true. Even though Armageddon itself is about to happen, stay true. The seventh bowl finishes God's wrath. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air. And out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, it is done. Then there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like has ever occurred since man has been on the earth. That would mean since Adam and Eve. So tremendous was the quake. So this is the biggest earthquake of all human history. The great city split into three parts. That would be Jerusalem. And the cities of the nations collapsed. I don't know if, I know that I've preached before that in Revelation, um, it actually says there will be an earthquake that will do all of other earthquakes that have ever happened. And God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. God finally answers all of the when God, how long God, why don't you do something God? He finally answers it and he pours out the full wine of his fury on this system of a anti-God, anti-Christ, anti-Bible, anti-everything world that hates God, hates God's people, hates God's word. Every island fled away. This is kind of wrapping up and bringing together all of the prophecies about the end of time. The islands all fled away. The mountains could not be found from the earth. From the sky, huge hailstones about a hundred pounds each fell upon men and they cursed. It's a strange thing. And don't you think that in the midst of all of this, people, instead of saying, God, I'm sorry. Instead, they say, God, I hate you. God, I curse you on account of the plague of hail because the plague was so terrible. A hundred pound hail, a uh, piece of hail would crash through a roof, would flatten a car to, to a, an aluminum can stance. So the wrath of God is completed with that. Now, obviously, in the midst of all that we've been reading, um, it's leading up to that. We're not there yet. We're getting there, but we're not there yet. I know that this particular sermon, The Wrath of God, tends to be really, really heavy-handed, obviously, and um, it, it doesn't seem like it would have much encouragement for a believer. But here's the encouragement. He's going to deal with sin and rebellion and world systems and satanic doctrines and the devil and the beast and the Antichrist and every, every injustice and injustice that was ever done. 
and he's going to answer it completely. And that's the encouragement for his people. The answer is in the Lord God himself. The answer isn't in some human movement. The answer is in the being and in the person of the Almighty God who is just and true and righteous in all that he does. Let's pray. How we thank you, Lord, again for the revelation. We don't know if this is going to occur tomorrow, next year, or in a thousand years, but we know that you are going to bring this all to a glorious end. For those who reject you, the consequence is too terrible to try to describe. And so help us, Lord, to really encourage people, not by trying to scare them with these things, but to try to woo them with the love of Christ demonstrated by the people of God, who should be showing the agape love of God to people around them. Help us, Lord. We're not in the business of terrifying people. We're in the business of preaching the good news that God does love you, and that if you're willing, He'll take away your sin. He'll spare you from the wrath that is coming. And if you laugh at that, and if you mock that, that's on you. If you think this is all a big game, that's on you. At the end of time, you'll see that this isn't a game at all. This is real life. This is real eternity. This is real consequence, and you cannot sidestep it. And now in Jesus' name, Confirm your word to the hearts of your people, Lord, the way the Holy Spirit intended it to be confirmed to them. May they trust you. May they trust your word. May they trust the author of your word, you, Jesus Christ, who is the word made flesh, who dwelt amongst us. Amen. Once again, thank you for watching with us today. We hope that you enjoy these videos. We know that we pro enjoy producing them for you. And if you like what you're hearing, please hit the subscribe button on Facebook, YouTube, and anytime we have a new video coming out, you'll be the first to know. Also, if you are enjoying these videos and they're helping you in your walk with Christ, please be sure to email Dory. The email is in the description and also right here, <laughs> I hope. No, just kidding. Anyway, have a great day and God bless.